Hey, good morning, church. How's everybody doing? Hey, uh, we actually have a couple things going on this morning. We're going to be in uh, in John chapter one in just a wow. I got louder. We're going to be in John chapter one in just a morning. Good morning to me. Wow. Hey, I was actually uh, I was actually out this week. I probably didn't notice because I was here last Sunday. But I was out all week. I was in uh, Philadelphia for the week. Went to a, uh, a summit at the American Bible Society. Basically, it was uh, some ministry stuff with uh, Through the Word for, for our app. And uh, I, I just, before I do get to anything else, I want to say thank you. Because all week long, I, I can't tell you how much I just knew there's somebody praying for me. I can just tell there's somebody praying. I knew Danny was praying for me. <laughs> Hey, if, uh, if you do pray for, for me, for your pastor, if you pray for, uh, for Mike, when, uh, when you pray for our ministry, you pray for Through the Word, thank you so much. It makes a difference. And uh, I, I can't even tell you, this week went phenomenally well. I had so many open doors, I, I couldn't believe it. Jonathan, who a lot of you know, Jonathan Ferguson, is uh, one of my right-hand guys on Through the Word. He came out with me, and we were in Philadelphia, and uh, we, were, we were meeting at the American Bible Society, which is a 200-year-old group, and there were people there from ministries all over the world. Amazing work God is doing in, in so many places. I got to meet people from Samaritan's Purse doing work where all of the hurricanes have hit, and hear the work they're doing just blows my mind. Got to hear, I got to meet with people from Uversion, uh, a Bible app with 280 million downloads, and, uh, and the work that they're doing. Got to meet people from uh, Deaf.Bible, an incredible group reaching deaf, hear their stories of, of translating the deaf Bible into all the languages. Amazing stuff. And, uh, and just what God, God is on the move. That's what I want you to know. God is on the move. In that, also this week, Through the Word, hit uh, a big milestone. We uh, Earlier, at the beginning of the year, I think I told you we were reaching about 6,000 people every day, and that's phenomenal. Uh, as of this week, we're reaching 10,000 people every day. We are... We, and praise God for that. We are, we are on a, a pace we're doubling every year. Um, and, uh, and that's just incredible. So that was awesome news this week. What I want to encourage you, one, this church, I mean, this is the home church of Through the Word. This is uh, our little church. We, we have a ministry that reaches 10,000 people every day. That's pretty amazing. We, uh, uh, but also, I want to encourage you more than that, that you are part of God's work. And that's one of the things that we want to come through every week, that God is on the move and working, and you are part of it. If you are praying for us, thank you. You are part of God's work. But you also join with us on the mission of God's work. And before we get into the Word, we're going to share one of those missions that we sent out. Now, when we send out missions, we, we usually team up with Refuge in Huntington Beach, one of the great things that we get to do as a church is team up together. So the team that went out to Romania at the beginning of this last summer was uh, a lot of people from Refuge in Huntington and some of our people here, Daisy and Noah, were on that team. But I'm going to invite them to come up and share some of the, uh, the work, the ministry that was done in Romania. It was a summer camp for, uh, for orphans that's put on once a year. And uh, so guys, come on up, uh, whoever it is, it's kind of, the whole team up. Whatever, whoever was on the team, come up and uh, I'll let Teresa do the uh, introductions. I'll just introduce this as Teresa Short, one of the leaders on the team. So we'll get to hear about some amazing things God did. This is not my gift right here. This is how God expands you. Um, so my husband, Peter, and I, um, this is our second year leading a team out to Romania. My husband and my boys went out the year before, and we fell in love with Kosti Keenan and his ministry out there. Kosti Keenan is an orphan. I'm sure he's come to the church, and he's supposed to be coming in December, so I'm sure he'll be here, and you guys can see him. Um, he ministers to orphans in Romania, and through that ministry, every summer, he puts on a camp. I'm going to be looking at Liz and Carol, because, you know, and Liz, oh, there's Andrea. So um, they put on a camp, and the Lord led... Pete and I to become team leaders for the care team that's here in the States and then ultimately going over and running a camp. So we went to camp in June and we took 60 kids from Bucharest out to a camp in the country about seven hour drive. 
which was long and fun. Um, but we had this amazing time at camp. It's a time for the kids to get away from their environment. If you go into, uh, are they showing the video? Okay, we'll show the video after. Um, they get to get out of their environment. They're, it's exactly like you would expect it to be in the orphanages. Very stark, very cold, very concrete. Um, they don't ha there's not a lot of warmth. There's not a lot of time away from those kind of things. And so we get to, we have the privilege of taking them away for an entire week where they sleep there. We get to love on them. We get to hang out with them. We play games with them and we connect with them. We build relationships with them. And I think that's the hugest part. When we come back, they're super blessed that we've come back because they don't have parents who come back and they don't have people who invest in their lives. And so when they see that we care and we love them when we come back, it just, it blows them away. We stay in contact with these kids. Each of us, the team, um, has connected with certain kids on the field and through Facebook and technology, we're able to speak with them all year long. And so I'm not gonna take up much more time. It was a super blessed occasion, but we have um, Rick, he's here. He's, he's been back walking with the Lord for about two years now and it was his first time on the mission field. So I want him to be able to share with you and to show you that it doesn't matter what's going on in your life, if you just open up your heart and you step out in faith, God can do amazing things. Because let me tell you, I never saw myself in Romania. And now I can tell you that I never see myself without Romania. I will go there until the Lord brings me home. So, and then you'll hear from Daisy and Noah. But first, let's show them the video if we can. And then we'll have them come up and share a little bit about their experience at camp. He raised us up When we were dead in our graves He bought us with the blood of His Son Open the floods of His grace He washed us clean Then wrote His name on our hearts He's claimed us as His daughters and sons Nothing can change who we are There's nothing better than to know we belong We've been in
All right. Am I good right here? Yeah. Okay. Um, wow, I still feel like I'm still there, um, even though it was just a few months ago. Uh, but this was my first time out of the country, especially going into the mission field. Uh, I definitely stepped out of my comfort zone. It was something that I never thought that I would be doing. Um, but, you know, I work with kids, you know, my Monday through Friday job. So when this opportunity came up, I felt called to do this. So, you know, we got there, you know, like I said, I have, I have two kids of my own and leaving them home was probably the hardest thing for me. And especially because it was for Father's Day, we were gone for Father's Day. So that kind of took a toll on me, but I knew f the real reason why we were there was to be there for those kids who don't have parents. They struggle every day, they just want someone to care and love them. So when we were there, I felt like I was doing my part, I was doing what God sent me there to do. So, you know, when we got there, you know, you go there with the open mind. You don't go there thinking, I'm gonna connect with this kid, I'm gonna connect with this kid. You're there with over 60 kids, so that it's really hard to get that individual time with every single one. But throughout that time, and when you're opening up and getting to know them, once you get past the language barrier, you get to know them as an individual and see like, you know, okay, well, you know, you're playing games, you're just, you're constantly, you're on your feet 24 seven. The only time you really get to rest is when you have to go to the bathroom or when you go to sleep. So you're, you're with the kids all day and you know, breakfast, lunch and dinner. And that's the time when you really get to connect with them. But you know, I, I work with junior high kids. So I kind of thought that I would connect more with the older kids, which I did at the same time. I connected with the older boys, but there was this one little girl there who is, probably a little bit shorter than my eight-year-old, and she ended up being 11 years old. And I didn't see her, I didn't really remember her face the first couple of days, but like, I think the second or third day of camp, I noticed that there was this little girl kind of like shadowing me. Like, I didn't know like, okay, like, hello, how you doing? But um, she ended up, it, she was just like, I just felt like I saw my daughters in her. And she just got really close to me, and it was just like, before I knew it, she was wanting to hold my hand everywhere we went. You know, she was, uh, you know, giving me a hug and a kiss on the cheek every time she went to bed. And I love you in Romania is uh, day you best. I'm sorry if I said it wrong, but she would always say that to me every night. So, you know, you go there and you spend time with these kids and it's just like it melts your heart. And, you know, and it makes you appreciate everything that you have when you come back home. And, you know, we still get to connect with the kids while we're there. I talk to a lot of them on Facebook. Um, you know, it may not be every day, but, you know, as long as you're connecting with them, you're communicating with them, it shows them that you still care. And they're always wanting, you know, are you going to come back? Are you going to come back? You know, but, you know, God willing, we're, able, we're all able to go back next year. Um, you know, but just overall, it was a, it was a great experience. Um, I definitely am looking forward to going back and... You know, that was, that was it. Just when you trust in God, he can, I, like I said, like Teresa said, you know, she never thought that she would go to Romania. I never thought that I would step foot in the mission field. But, you know, when you put your trust in him, there's no telling where he'll put you. And he'll take you out of your comfort zone. You know, just me talking to the mic, that's out of my comfort zone. But <laughs> God's pushing me to do this. So, but thank you. And, you know, hopefully we'll hear from uh, Noah right now. My mom wants us to go together for some reason. Because I don't know. Because we go together. Okay. <laughs> because we go together. All right. Well, you Romania. Okay. <laughs> this was my third time going. Um, I really love this trip because every time we go, we get to see the same kids, some new kids, but we get to come back and visit the familiar faces that we saw the previous year. And that means a lot when you <laughs> leave from a mission field and then you go back to it and you see these faces and you see how some of them are growing, how some of them are making good choices. And the first year I went with these kids, a lot of them were in a really, really dark place. Um, but with keeping contact with them and then coming back and seeing how they're improving, that's, that's a blessing. It's so amazing to see that. And I, I see it with all these different kids and how they're growing older, come back like a year later, their faces are changing, their voices are all deeper, and it's, it's freaky. But then you see how they're, like, they're growing, and some are like, hey, I've been reading my Bible every day. I've been praying and doing all these things, and it's, it's amazing to see that. 
Sí, sí, sí. sí. <coughs> Problem with going up with the tall person is I'm not. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so it was really awesome to go back. And like he said, when you get to go back and see the same kids, I mean, it's one thing to go for a week and pour into these kids. But when you come back and they say, oh, you came back for me. And those kids were keeping in contact all year, like Rick said. Um, it's cool because you get to further build that relationship. And they trust you even more. So you get to go deeper every time. Um, if you guys remember during that time, I was in my boot on my crutches. And actually, my first day off my crutches was going into the airport to Romania. So that was a crazy leap of faith for me and I was praying the whole time, Lord, don't let me hold back from these kids. But it was so cool because, because I was in my boot and the train we were on was like really rough, kind of patchy grass so it was like all over the place. It was crazy, probably tweaked my foot for life. But it was cool because I got to sit back with the kids who were in the back, the ones who weren't really playing with everyone, who just wanted to sit by themselves. And it was cool because there was this one boy who went last year. Um, it was kind of the life of the party kind of guy, which I'm not. So I never got to connect with him last year as much. But this year, because of my boo, I got to sit down and I was like, hey, do you want to see my foot? And he was like, yes, because little boys. He was like 12 or 13. And it was cool because I had a translator with me. And as I'm taking it off, I was asking him, like, what do you think it's going to look like? He was thinking it was like all bloody and gross. I was like, no, it's not that cool. But it's so cool because it opened up that opportunity for us. And while this kid, he was a bit of a punk, and he was always making fun of kids, but it was cool because it opened up that opportunity for him to be open with us. Or one day we saw him sitting and he was crying because these kids were messing with him and were making him feel less than he really was. And we got to share and speak into his life and tell him that people can't tell him that he is less than what he is because God made him who he is. And one more cool thing I want to share is, so we were singing that song earlier, um, Good, Good Father. Every day we sang that with the kids. And at first it was like, man, we're singing about a good father with these kids who don't have a father. Like, how are they going to take that? And my favorite image was this little boy, Eddie, who was about eight or nine. But last year I connected with him. He started calling me mama. So cute. But this year I would watch him sing it. And you could tell that he was worshiping, that he was worshiping his father and it blew me away that these kids who, in the area that they're in, they're not given much hope of the future, and they're looked down upon, and they're constantly told every day by society, by themselves, by other peers, that they're not worth it, that they're not going to ever make it in life because they're orphans. And here they are singing to their father, their good father, who loves them just because he made them and because he loves to love on them. And it was so cool to be a part of that. One more thing, too, guys. Um, really be praying for these kids. Um, they, before we left, a lot of them were asking, like, how are you going to remember us? Like, what are you going to be doing? I'm like, there's a lot of people back home where we are that are praying for you guys every single day. I've been praying for them every single day. So really be praying for these kids because prayer is powerful, and it can change their lives in a, a brilliant way. So please be praying for them. And just to round it out, um, yeah, just on a practical note, like Noah said, be praying. We already have camp scheduled for July of next year. The team is going, most of us, I think, are going back. Fifteen went out um, this last summer, and I think we have at least that many. All of us want to return, so be praying for provision. And we'd love to stick around and hear Chris's teaching because he's an awesome teacher. But we actually have a fundraiser going on. Look at this <laughs> fundraiser going on. For Romania right now at Refuge um, Huntington Beach. So be praying for the kids, be praying for the team, be praying for provision, because what the care team does here is we put on fundraisers all year long to be able to run that camp, to be able to bring the orphans to Romania. It's not for ourselves individually to go. The Lord provides in different ways for that, but it's to get the kids there. And right now we're also earning funds so they can have Christmas. So um, if we don't the Lord totally provides it, and he always shows off and does it abundantly. But in order for Coasty to be doing what he does, we, on the other side, on the state side, are providing funds for him to do it. So be praying for the kids, for sure. We can tell you thousands of stories of what went on, on at camp, and it'll make you all cry, because we all go, I'll start crying, because I cry, because um, we love it there. But yeah, just please be praying for the team, and especially for the orphans. So thank you, guys. All right, guys, open to the book of John in chapter 1. I'm 
unless you're the Romania team, then just walk away. <laughs> Still love you. Hey, for those of you who didn't figure out, Daisy is my daughter. And she's pretty awesome, I think. I am blessed. And uh, for those, of you, and Daisy and Noah are both part of this church. If you think, I don't always see them out here because they are very often back there working with those kids or out there working with those kids. Thanks, Eric. Okay, John chapter one. Now, uh, one thing that I hope you see as uh, when you hear stories of mission and what God is doing is that when you follow Jesus, there is no telling where you might end up. When you follow Jesus, get ready for adventure. And that's really the heart of what we're looking at today. What does it mean to follow Jesus? All right, we're going to read in John chapter 1. I'm going to start at verse 35 just to make sure y'all don't fall asleep and to show a little respect for the word today. Let's stand up and I'm going to read John chapter 1. I'm going to start at 35. We're going to go to the end of the chapter. In our study today, we're going to go up through 211, but for reading, I'll just start at verse 35. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? 39, Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying and spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon, verse 40. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter, 43. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said to him, Here is a true Israelite in whom there is no deceit. 48. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus said, You believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. He then added, Very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Father, we thank you for your word. And Holy Spirit, we ask that you would teach us, guide us in understanding, and speak to us here, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Everyone said? Amen. Amen. Grab a seat. What does it mean to follow Jesus? Two simple words. It is, after all, the heart of being a Christian. If you are a Christian, it comes down to those two words. You follow Jesus. When Jesus called his disciples, he used those two words again and again. Follow me. And that's what it is. There's a whole lot to being a Christian, but when you get down to it, you got to follow Jesus. So what does that mean for us? In John 1, we've been introduced to Jesus. Now we get to meet, for the first time, his disciples. And the word disciple means follower. The guys who followed him around. Now, if you know the Bible, if you've been reading the Bible, you've met these guys before. We're going to meet 
Andrew and Philip and Simon, who gets his name changed to Peter, we meet Nathaniel. And, uh, and if you grew up with the Bible, maybe at some point you had to memorize the names of the 12 disciples. Everybody always forgets Bartholomew. But pretend for a second, for, for, for today, forget that you know that someday these guys will be called the Apostles, capital A, Apostles. Forget that you know that these guys are the founding fathers of the church. You know, one of the really fascinating things, I got, when I got to go to Philadelphia this week, and uh, um, I was there for the, the, the summit with the American Bible Society and such, but Jonathan, who went with me, is a history buff. In fact, he's back in school, he's a history major. So visiting Philadelphia was like the ultimate playground for... Uh, for American history major, and so we went and visited Independence Hall and heard the story of the, uh, the signing of the Declaration of Independence and the writing of the, uh, of the Constitution of our country, and for most of us, this is all historical stuff, and we look back on guys like Washington and Hamilton and Madison as, you know, American heroes that founded the country, but when you get the stories, for them, they were not American heroes. They uh, mostly were, were young. Washington was one of the oldest in his 40s, and uh, everybody else looked up to him like a dad because most of the guys were in their 20s. And trying to stitch together a, a country and some rules to run a country in a way that had never been done before, nothing like anything the world had ever seen. And it's really interesting to get their stories from a human perspective of just a regular person trying to get by in the world and it's getting really hard. Well, the disciples, the stories we have of them here are very human. They don't know that they get to be called the apostles, the founding fathers of the church. In fact, at this point, they don't even know Jesus. They haven't met Jesus yet. They may have, they, they may have heard a little bit about him, just a, a tiny bit. John the Baptist spoke about him. They know who John the Baptist is. These guys are young. Probably the youngest among them, uh, generally believed to be John, was probably around 17. The, the rest of the guys were probably up through their, their young 20s. Peter is generally considered the oldest, according to tradition. The Bible doesn't tell us their ages, but they stuck around for a good several decades after this, so it's pretty clear that they must have been quite young. They are young. They are Jewish. They've been raised with religion. They've been raised with the knowledge of God. They've been raised with the, the teaching about God. They've, they've gone to synagogue most of their lives and they've, been, they've learned what we call the Old Testament and the promises of Messiah. Now, the Jewish life that they grew up in under the control of Rome was hard, was very hard. Jews were essentially at the level of slaves and they were treated as such. And the treatment by the, the Roman government, all the, the Romans established a peace of a sword. It was peace at the end of a sword. It was very much forced. And in the Jewish world, the life and talk around the community was very much about politics. <laughs> there was a lot of passion. There was a lot of fire among especially guys at this age who got up and preached and talked about ways to solve their issues, whether it was to take up swords against Rome or just to go along with what, what Rome pushed upon them. There, there was a lot of religious fervor. There was a lot of ideas. There was a lot of hope for some kind of a solution in a very dark time. They are young. They are Jewish. They are searching for something. Each one is different as we meet them, but they are looking for something. And they have heard a guy named John, John the Baptist, to come along. And the first disciples we meet are guys who had been following John. If you remember John from the last couple of weeks, John preached a message of repentance. The heart of John's message was two things. First, repentance. Second, Jesus is coming. Messiah is on the way. Now, what is repentance? Repentance is important because to understand, in order to understand these guys, you've got to understand where they're at. They've just been baptized by John. They've just been listening to the preaching of John. And John's message really came down to this, to repentance. Repentance means to change your mind. Literally translated, change your mind. But specifically, to change your mind about the way you've been living. You look at yourself, you look at your life, and repentance means you basically decide, I don't want to live like this anymore. This isn't the life I want. The decisions I've been making, 
I decided they were wrong. And I just want to change direction. Now, as we go forward through the Bible, we're going to find that John's message was essential. It is the first step. It is the building block to following Jesus. Before you can follow Jesus, you got to stop following whatever it is you were following before. Because you can't serve two masters. And so John was sent as a forerunner. God sent John the Baptist as a forerunner to Jesus on purpose because this was the one key message. In fact, if you fast forward a little ways, you're going to find a, a group of characters who just keep refusing to follow Jesus. They just can't, they see the miracles. They, they hear his incredible compassion for people. They see the love of Jesus. And they see him defy the laws of science and heal people in incredible ways. And they just won't give in to follow Jesus and the Bible explains because they refused to listen to John. And it says these words. It says, they rejected God's purpose for their lives. They rejected God's purpose for their lives for this one reason. They wouldn't hear this one message, repent. Repent. Change your mind. Change direction. The message isn't fix your whole life. Get yourself all cleaned up and get back on the right path. That's not how you start with Jesus. You're never going to get there. You can't do it. Somebody who's wallowing in the mud can't clean all the mud off themselves. It's everywhere. It just says, change your mind. Repent. These guys had followed John the Baptist. We know that much about them. Something in their life, they heard the call of John to change direction. And John prepared the way for the Lord in their lives as they repented. They didn't have a whole solution. They didn't know how to get it right. They just knew they had it wrong before and they didn't want to live that way anymore. So put yourself in their shoes for a moment as today, for the first time, they will meet a man named Jesus. Now for them, it was not a peculiar name as it might be if you met somebody named Jesus in English. Now, if you live in Mexico, you meet somebody named Jesus, it's a perfectly normal name, which actually in Jesus' time it was as well. His name was actually what we say, Joshua. Somebody named Josh today, fairly common name, right? Jesus' name was Yeshua, it's where we get the name Joshua. Jesus, the way we say Jesus, was actually a transliteration that came from the Greek version and kind of got morphed over time. What we end up with in English is Jesus. Now, in America, you don't generally meet somebody on the street named Jesus, but turn it around for a second. If you meet somebody named Jesus, you can meet two people named Jesus here, <laughs> and it's perfectly not a normal name in Mexico, which at his time, you know what the name means? You know what Jesus' name means? The Lord saves. The Lord is salvation. A lot of parents like that name in Jesus' time because they needed some salvation. So to name their kid the Lord saves, it's a pretty good name, but Jesus isn't just a hope that the Lord saves. Jesus is the Lord saves. And for these disciples who are going to meet a guy named Joshua, going to meet Jesus in just a moment, they will soon learn that to follow Jesus will be the great adventure of their lifetime. So let's start in verse 35. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. Now, this is the second time he's told them that. Just a couple days earlier, a few verses back, he said the same thing. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, the first time he said it, that John's disciples, because John had disciples too. You understand, disciples was a fairly normal practice. We don't have people who call themselves disciples today, but it really just meant follower. And to have disciples, rabbis had disciples Rabbis, teachers of the word, leaders among the Jews, they would invite people to follow after them. In fact, it was a normal practice among the Greeks and the Romans as well. You find among the philosophers and the Greeks, they would have their disciples, their followers, like Aristotle had followers, Plato and Socrates, they all had their, their followers. So young men would go following after, and generally the invitation would be just the way Jesus gave it an invitation to follow me. And usually that meant going through some kind of schooling of some sort, but you followed specifically after a teacher. Well, John was such a powerful preacher and teacher that young men and women would follow after and say, I want to follow whatever it is you're doing. And so these guys who are going to meet have been following John for some time, just part of his ministries. He preached repentance. They're like, yeah, we need to change. We need to get right with God. They didn't know how it was all going to work out. But John pointed to them and said, as he pointed to Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, 
For you and I, that might be an odd thing to say, but for a young Jewish man, it made a lot of sense. They knew who the Lamb of God was. Well, the Lamb of God was the sacrifices in the temple that they would see every day. Sacrifices were happening all the time. And they knew that the sacrifices were about getting right with God. The whole teaching of the, of the book of Leviticus, these guys would grow up with, they, they would memorize major parts of the Torah going up. So when they, they heard the Lamb of God, they knew exactly what he was saying. Especially when he said the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In other words, how... The one who gets you right. What wouldn't make sense, what they'd never heard before, was that John was pointing at a man, not a lamb. Look, the lamb of God. Second time he said it, and this time it clicks for the disciples. In verse 37, when the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? So Jesus is just walking along. you got to picture this in human terms. Jesus is, is going about whatever business he had that day. And John is walking in some other direction. And he tells them, behold the Lamb of God. And they're like, he said this a couple times. Seems important. Let's see what he's doing. So two of these guys just kind of cruising behind Jesus. You talk to him. You talk to him. You talk to him. I don't know. What do I say? I don't even know exactly who he is. Just seems, John seemed to think this is really important. I don't get the whole Lamb of God thing, but they're just kind of like hanging behind him and Jesus stops, turns around and says, what do you want? <laughs> and they were just stopped and, I don't know, what do you do at that point? What do you want? And so they said, Rabbi, which means teacher. It was a normal, respectful thing to call him, like saying pastor. Rabbi, where are you staying? <laughs> it's kind of a, hey, can we hang out with you today? <laughs> Now, Jesus' first question, this is Jesus' first words in John's gospel. This is the recording of what Jesus, this is the first time Jesus says anything for us. And his first words are, what do you want? What are you looking for? I think there's some more depth to this question. When we meet Jesus, the first meeting with Jesus, the disciples, the first question they get, what are you looking for? What do you seek I think there's more to it than just, hey, what are you guys doing following me? I think he's challenging them to the heart with a question that I think we should ask ourselves. I think that Jesus would ask you, what are you looking for? When we first come around to Jesus, you know what I'm talking about, when you first start thinking about it. And maybe, I might check out church, I might open up a Bible. The first question is, what are you looking for? You looking for breakfast? Looking for some friends? It's a good place for both of those things. <laughs> you looking for a girl? Looking for a guy? There's some great ones here, but probably should be looking for something else first. <laughs> what do you want in life? Now, Jesus challenges them with that, and they say, Rabbi, where are you staying? Verse 39. Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying and spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Now, we don't know the whole story of this day, but basically it just starts with they spent the day with Jesus. Following Jesus just started with the first step. Jesus says, come and you will see. In other words, he says, just hang out with me. Spend the day. Jesus doesn't lay out, he doesn't walk up to him and, and just like lay out the whole gospel. All right, this is it. Four spiritual laws. He doesn't hit them with a, with a big overview of the Old Testament. There might be a place for that, absolutely. But really, it just start, following Jesus just starts, just try it out. Just spend some time with Jesus. Invite him into your day. Invite him to be part. Hang out where Jesus hangs out a little bit. This is a pretty good place. But you might be surprised some of the places we're going to find Jesus hanging out. Hang out around the people who are following Jesus, because you're going to find Jesus there. And just see what it's about. But uh, first thing I want you to see, though, is that before that, it started with John. It started with John's testimony. That's what we've had so far. What the, why did these guys follow Jesus? Because they were following John, and they trusted him. And when John testified... 
they started following Jesus. This is the essential power of testimony, and it's built on trust. In fact, John's gospel, what we're reading, different John, the, the John who wrote this is different from John the Baptist, but the John who wrote this, his entire gospel is built on testimonies. In fact, it is a testimony. If you read the second to last verse in the entire gospel of John, it says, this is the disciple who testifies to these things. He wrote them down. We know that his testimony is true. It's a testimony. All four of the Gospels are testimonies. What's the big deal about a testimony? You know what testimony means? Testimony, when, where would you hear the word testimony in normal everyday life? Court. What does a testimony mean in court? Somebody steps, steps up and says, this is what I saw. What's that used for? It, it's trying to establish the facts of the case. There's a jury who's trying to figure out what really happened, and they need to hear somebody share what happened. Now, that's good for the jury, but you know, you and I, we use testimony all the time. I was in Philadelphia. I don't know Philadelphia. I know I, all I know is I got to find a good cheesesteak. So, <laughs> so if you're in Philadelphia, you know how you do that? You know how you find a good cheesesteak? You know what most of us do? Get the old Yelp out. <laughs> You know why people use Yelp? Because it's all testimonies. That's the whole thing. Because nobody gets to pay. It's, it's not an advertisement, although there's ads on it. You skip past the ones that are advertised. And, and you go to the testimonies. But then you, you realize, how do I know I trust these people? They could be make-believe people. In fact, there are companies. If, if you run a restaurant, you can pay a company to, to come up with 20 review, made-up reviews for you from seemingly real people. You see, testimony is important, but... Testimony has to come with trust if you're really going to believe it. In fact, that's really our formula, isn't it? Testimony plus trust equals truth. When I hear a testimony, I don't know if that's truth, but if I trust the person, all right, I'm going to believe that's true. So what did I do? We went on to Facebook and say, we went on to th our, our Through the Word site, and, and Jonathan posted, anybody in Philly who listens to Through the Word, can you recommend a good Philly cheesesteak? <laughs> And we got some feedback from people who we have some relationship established with. It makes a big difference if you know the person. Testimony is how we come to faith. It's how we decide what we believe, isn't it? When you're trying to decide what to follow, it's all about, wait, I trust this person, and if they say it's true, then I'll give it a chance. And then when you experience it for yourself, that's the path of the disciples here. They know John the Baptist. They've gotten a relationship. I know I can trust this guy. I know he's for real. And then when John the Baptist says, follow him, they, it's not, they haven't put their faith in him yet. We're going to see that soon. But first they say, I'll give him a chance because I trust John. I'm going to trust Jesus. I'm going to give him a chance. And pretty soon we're going to see what it takes to put their faith in him. This is why it's so important for you, Christian, to be a man, a woman, worthy of trust. Because when somebody you know comes to faith, you're going to pray for them. That's going to be a big part of it. Here's what it's going to take. They need to hear your testimony. They need to hear your story. They need to see it in your life. And when they hear your testimony, they're going to decide, is this a person I trust? Is he for real? Is she genuine? Your testimony is, is what changes lives. Is what changes... It, set souls free because they hear your testimony. I don't mean just your explanation of the gospel. I mean this, your life, what you have seen Jesus do in your life when you share that story. That's why we do testimonies up here so often. That's why we have the, the Romania team share. That's why we have people share lives. Those are testimonies. But your testimony is only as valuable as your good name, as how much people trust you. That's why Proverbs says a good name is worth more than gold. Because people's souls are on the line with your good name. Is your life worthy of trust? So let's look at what John's testimony was real quick. Reminder, context is really important here. Quick reminder of what John, not John the Baptist, but what John the Apostle says about Jesus. He introduces Jesus back in verse 1 as the word become flesh. The, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, the Word was God. He introduces Jesus as the origin, the original, and the Word was God. John gets right to the point, verse 1, up front, this Jesus, I'm going to introduce you, this whole testimony I'm going to give, you need to know Jesus is creator God. Through him all things were made, without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. When he introduces Jesus, he doesn't go, 
He just lays it out. In him was life. That life, man, it is the light. It is how we see. And he introduces John as a testimony. Now, we got that the last couple weeks. I'm not going to go through it all. But one little thing I want you to see he says about Jesus. When you put Jesus in the, into the context of religion, into the context of the Bible, he introduces him, verse 17, for the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. You know what grace means? It means God loves you just because he loves you. You don't earn it. You don't deserve it. God just plain loves you. Grace is the word for a gift. God's love for you is a gift, and you don't pay for a gift. He loves you right here, right now. And the amazing thing is that in Jesus, grace comes with truth. In other words, Jesus knows the truth about you. He knows exactly who you are, and he brings grace right where you're at. Jesus died for you while you were a sinner. Jesus is good to you when you were bad. With Jesus comes grace and truth. And here we come back to the disciples. Let's see what they have to say after they hang out with Jesus. Come and you will see, Jesus said in verse 39, verse 40, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard that what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. Now understand, every Jewish young man knows who the Messiah is. This isn't a weird word to them like, so who? Everyone knows, it, and Jesus Christ, the word Christ was not a swear word then. It, was, it meant the Holy One, the Chosen One, the one who's going to set things right. This is the, the, it's our hope. This is the one we're looking for, to set things right. And Andrew, as soon as he finds out about Jesus, hangs out with him for a little while, and he says, i got to go tell my brother. Now, I don't know the relationship between these two, but if I know one thing about brothers, their relationship was not all good all the time. But he goes and he tells his brother. And he brings his brother Simon to meet Jesus. Jesus, in verse 42, he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. Now, Peter's a guy we know. Peter, if you know just a little bit of Bible, you probably heard of Peter. But that wasn't his name. When he meets Jesus, his name is Simon. And Jesus says to him, you are Simon. Now, there's no indication that anybody has told Jesus what Simon's name is. I don't know if he just knew it because he knew it or if Andrew had said, hey, I'm going to go get Simon. But more importantly than that, Jesus knew him. And the amazing thing to me is that when Jesus knows you, he doesn't just know you now. When he says, you are Simon, he's basically saying, I know you. I know who you are that you see yourself. But when Jesus looks at you, he doesn't just see who you are now. He says, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Peter. I know you now, but I know who you're going to be. One of my absolute favorite things about this amazing guy named Jesus is that he can see you, not just who you are now, he sees who you will be. He doesn't ignore who you are now, but he knows who you're going to be. And that's pretty amazing about Jesus. Simon can be translated sand or, or shifting sand. You could call him Sandy. But his, which can be a guy's name. There's plenty of guys named Sandy. The name Peter means rock. You call him Rocky. And the transformation you're going to see in, Jesus, in, in Simon's life is that very transformation. Throughout the, the, the Gospels, you, you see Simon as a guy who's always shifting, who's never stable. He'll get so passionate about what he believes in it, and then he'll utterly fail just a moment later. Shifting sand. You know, when you step on sand, there's nothing, nothing stable about it. But Jesus says, this is who you're going to be. And it's not going to happen all at once. In fact, as you go through the... the Gospels, you find Jesus will go back and forth calling him Peter and calling him Simon. It won't happen all at once, but by the time you get to the book of Acts, Peter is absolutely a rock, as stable as can be, a leader in the church who others can build their faith on and follow after because they know this guy is stable. 
Wherever you're at now, Jesus isn't leaving you there. Did you know that? Jesus isn't going to leave you where you're at now. He sees where you're going and he's going to lead you there. To follow Jesus is to follow a journey to the person you will become, to the one who God has called you to be. To meet Jesus right now is to meet grace and truth together. He knows exactly who you are. He knows what you've done. You can't hide anything. But he meets you with grace and he leads you on a journey to glory, to who God has called you to be. Verse 43, the next day Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Two little words, follow me. Now we get introduced to another of the disciples. His name is Philip. Philip is a favorite of mine. Verse 44, Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Now, the first thing I want you to see is when disciples find Jesus, two in a row, what do they do? They go tell somebody. You got to go tell somebody. I mean, Jesus, this Jesus is amazing. So immediately he just goes and tells his buddy Nathaniel, we found him. I mean, the, 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 proph, the prophesied one, Moses talks about him, the, the prophet who's going to come, it's Jesus of Nazareth. Nathaniel says, Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Now, I don't know what prejudice he had against Nazareth. Apparently, they had a bad name, that nothing good comes from Nazareth. Now, maybe it was because Nathanael was a studied Jew and knew that the Messiah was supposed to be born in Bethlehem, and he said, wait, you got the wrong place. Or maybe he just had a prejudice from growing up that everybody he ever ran into from Nazareth was not a savior. <laughs> Nazareth. So how does Philip solve this problem? He's got this friend who's got some prejudice already in him against this Jesus. You're going to meet people when you try to bring him in who's going to have something in him against religion, something in him against church, something in him. And what does he say? Just come and see. He doesn't lay out some big case for Nazareth. You know, if you look in the Old Testament, you'll find that, yes, although Jesus was to be born in Bethlehem, that he actually grew up and went to Egypt and then he went to Nazareth. He doesn't try to lay out a whole Bible study for him. He's not going to the apologetics. He just says, come and see. When you get into an argument with somebody about whatever issue they have, you can talk about it, but at some point you just got to say, you just got to check it out for yourself. You're not going to know until you check it out for yourself. Come and see, said Philip. 47, when Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, here is a true Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Here is a true Israelite. Jesus meets him and knows him right away. We don't know that much about Nathaniel, but something in Nathaniel was about genuineness. Nathaniel's a guy who, who values being real. In him, there's no deceit. Man of integrity. He wanted to be true. If he's going to be an Israelite, he's going to be a true Israelite. And Jesus knows this is what matters to Nathaniel. He speaks right to his heart. Nathaniel says, verse 48, how do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. He meets Jesus and Jesus just pinpoints him to the heart and says, I saw you before. Now, catch this. I, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. In other words, he knew, Jesus knew him before anyone ever told him about Jesus. Jesus knew him first. And Nathaniel was blown away. How did you know I was under a fig tree? That was like way over there somewhere. That was the other side. You weren't over there. I was hanging out under a fig tree. We don't know what was happening. I, I would bet that Nathaniel was hanging out under a fig tree. I'm guessing he was having an important moment in his heart. Something must have been going on. I'm guessing maybe he was in prayer. Maybe he was, he was, I don't know. But you know what I'm talking about when you just hit that moment when you need God right then. You need God to be real. You need God to be there. And maybe you throw up a prayer and you don't know if he's listening or not. But a little time passes and you realize God saw me right there. He heard that prayer. God is for real. And for Nathaniel, this Jesus character represents the reality of God. And he says, you are the son of God and you are the king of Israel. You know, sometimes that'll happen when you're in a Bible study and the guy up here is speaking like he knows exactly what's going on with you. And I'll tell you right now, I have no idea what's going on with any of you, except maybe Mike. <laughs> and, 
I'm, I'm not the one preaching to your heart. The Holy Spirit is the one preaching to your heart. And when he meets you, I know what that's like to sit in a Bible study and God meets you right there. This is the incredible thing about Jesus, that Jesus is personal. This is the amazing thing about being part of ministry with Jesus, is Jesus is personal. Remember I told you at the, at the beginning of, uh, of, before we even started, that through the word, we just hit 10,000 listeners. 10,000. Now 10,000, I, I like big numbers, but you know what I really like? I like individuals. What really amazes me is that Jesus meets individuals. I got a, uh, a Facebook message from a woman I met in Indiana. You guys remember a few months ago, I got invited to church in Indiana to go speak. She, uh, when I was there, she, I had shared, hey, we're reaching 9,000 listeners every day. And she came up to me right after. She's a little firecracker. Uh, and, uh, and she came up to me afterward, and uh, I think her name is Betsy. And she said, I'm praying for 10,000, Pastor. <laughs> You're going to reach 10,000. And guess what? Sure enough, the week that we hit 10,000, she messaged me, and uh, she's a hairdresser. She said, uh, I, just want to, I just want to tell you a story. I don't know if you, you, you read on Facebook. I read on Facebook. Somebody hit me. And uh, I just wanted to let you know, I was, uh, I, I was doing hair, and uh, a man walked in, and I could just tell he was down, and God just put on my heart to tell him about through the word. And uh, I didn't want to, but I told him. So she told him about through the word. She, he comes in a, uh, a few weeks later for his next haircut, and, uh, and he tells her, you know, you had no way of knowing this, but when I walked in here last time, I, that day I was ready to give up on God, ready to give up on recovery, and give up on, on everything. And you listened to God and told me about, in between you and this app I've been listening to, you saved my life. And I, I <laughs> that's pretty good. <laughs> I want to tell you right now, I can't do that. And you can't do that, but we're all a part of it. That those 10,000 who listen, every single one's an individual because Jesus has this incredible way of preaching to a crowd, preaching on the internet, on the radio, and reaching an individual and knowing right where you're at. And when you experience that, when you know Nathaniel says, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus said, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. He then added, very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the son of man. Now, what does that mean? Well, for you and I, we might not understand that, but I think Nathaniel, who was clearly a student of the Bible, Nathaniel, he, the reason he, he could say son of God, king of Israel, because he knew the promises. He knew that the Messiah, the one who was to come, was the son of God and the king of Israel. And I think Nathaniel would get it, because Jesus is referring to a story that if you were here about a month ago that we went over, remember the story of Jacob, when Jacob Remember Jacob who followed the God of his father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, not the God of Jacob, not yet. He followed his father's God. And it wasn't really so much follow as kind of believe in from a distance. But his life was hard. Jacob the deceiver who ran away from home. His brother wanted to kill him, who ran away and spent a few decades away. And by the time but on his way out, when he was running away from everything he'd ever done wrong, remember he was alone in, out in the middle of the desert in Padanaram. He laid his head on a rock for a pillow. And in the night, he had a vision. And he saw heaven opened up. And there was a ladder. We call it Jacob's ladder. It was a ladder, a stairway. We don't know exactly what it looked like. But what was happening is that heaven was open at the top. And there were angels going down to earth and coming back up again. There was, and he said, there's a gateway here, an opening, a connection between heaven and earth. And he was blown away. Jesus refers to that and says, you're impressed, Nathaniel, because I saw you. You're going to see greater things than that. You will see heaven opened and you will see the angels of God ascending and descending on the son of man. Now, son of man Nathaniel would recognize is a reference to the Messiah, meaning that Messiah would be human. He's called Son of God and Son of Man, meaning he is human and God. And he's saying, you're going to see heaven open up and you're going to see the angels going up and down. In other words, he's saying, you're going to find out that Messiah, the one you're looking at, Jesus, is that ladder, that stairway, the way, the truth, and the life. 
the only way to heaven. Now, Nathaniel doesn't get all that yet, and maybe you're not there yet. But stick around. Come and see. Hang out for a while. Spend some time with Jesus, and you will see greater things than that. Maybe Jesus kind of pierced your heart a little bit today. He said, how'd, how'd the preacher know I, what was going on in my life? I don't know. I have no idea. But the Holy Spirit does. And you say, I'm not ready to believe just yet. Hang out with Jesus. Hang out. Stick around, and you will see heaven opened up. And you will see that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Now, I was supposed to get through 211 and get the story of Jesus turning water to wine, but you will have to wait for Jesus' first miracle for next week. I'm going to invite the worship team to come back up, and we're going to pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for your word, for your truth. Lord, we thank you for meeting us right here, for the incredible way that you know us, that you step into our life and speak to us and show us that you know who we are. But Lord, you also show us that you know who we will be and that you are willing to hold on for the journey to see who we will be, who will we become. Because Lord, your plans for us are good to give us a future and a hope because you love us, because you meet us where we are in the midst of our sin, and you are the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You take away our sin at the cross, Lord. Lord, meet us here and show us where we're going. Help us to follow you step by step. Lead us on that adventure, Lord. Adventure to walk through life and adventure to become who you call us to be. And We pray in your name. Everyone said? Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing one more song.